here's what the Enlightenment is. You guys probably know this because I think you've read about it already in the textbook. But imagine that people were inspired by the scientific revolution. The scientific revolution is you know using mo to come up with laws that uh, that always work the exact same way. Well. People looked at that and said, well, uh, you know, through Mo, they were able to come up with laws about how the universe works. How about we use, not Mo, but we use our minds anyway, and we use reason or rationality to question traditional beliefs or question the way things were done traditionally in terms of politics, uh, in terms of society, social relations, in terms of the economy in terms of religion, in, in education, in the way we think about how people think. Use reason to uh, to question the traditional, be skeptical, and then find a new rational reform for any one of those possible things. And a little bit more than that. Just like in the scientific revolution, who is it that the, that the, the early scientific thinkers were questioning? And doubting, who gave who gave us the, the quote unquote scientific knowledge from from antiquity? Uh, the church was a, was a, a, a kind of like a repository, but who were the people who thought up that stuff? Good, yeah, Greeks, Romans, Aristotle, uh, Ptolemy, and so on. Fantastic. So, just like you would question those guys and come up with new understandings of the world, you could question everything that's been happening to come up with. Uh, with new ways of, of running things. And once again, we can kind of go back to that idea of absolutism versus constitutionalism with two philosophers or two uh, political thinkers. One of them is Thomas Hobbes, who is a proponent of absolutist government, and the other one is John Locke, who is a proponent of constitutional government. And in addition to that, he talks a little bit about uh, the freedom of religion, and then also a little bit about just education and, and maybe how the mind works. Of those two guys, uh, last in the ninth grade uh, government, we probably talked a lot more about which one of the two. Yeah, and and Locke is sort of you know he's kind of like our our uh, Sir Isaac Newton uh, of of science. John Locke is kind of like our Sir Isaac Newton of politics, I suppose. They're both products of their their time, uh, in addition. In other words, Thomas Hobbes lives earlier than, uh, than John Locke and experiences the English Civil War. Uh, John Locke is, is a little bit later, and he's going to experience the glorious revolution. Right after the English Civil War, which ends around 1649 with the beheading of Charles I, there was, uh, he, he, he wrote a, a text, he wrote a book called Leviathan. Uh, a lot of these people who are thinking about how to change things, how to reform things, what kind of a system would work, they think about what they think humans are like. And for Hobbes, as he's, he's watching the Civil War rage, he, he thinks that human nature, uh, go back to a period of time, for example, before civilization, even nowadays, Humans are basically kind of evil, they're egotistical, they're pleasure seeking, they um, you know, they want to look out only for themselves. And once again, if you, you imagine a period of time of war, yeah, society does get like that, right? People in, in, in times of war, times of crisis, are not always going to be nice to each other. When he talks about man in a natural state, or man sort of back in caveman times, where you just have a bunch of, bunch of people wandering around, you don't have a civilization yet, he talks about how man is like that, and how uh, a natural state of man is kind of war of all against all. He has this quote where he says, life in a state of nature is nasty, brutish, and short. And you can imagine that in, in that period of time, with people, you know, clubbing each other over the head, over carcasses of animals to eat, um, really not much nice happens. Uh, one thing that does happen that all of these guys realize is civilization develops, or a society develops, a commonwealth develops. 
And so people give up their absolute freedoms to live together for the wealth of all or for the welfare of all. You have to give up your absolute freedom to club somebody else over the head. Hobbes Hobbes thinks, because of the nature of human beings, that people need to give up their their freedom to club each other over the head to a person or a, a representative body, a sovereign. And that, that sovereign is probably going to be a king. So once again, absolute government. The sovereign is absolute, and the sovereign's power is unlimited. The sovereign is going to know better than an individual about what works for everyone. There is no possibility for resistance. There is no possibility for protest. When the sovereign tells you something, you just have to go along with it and do it. I suppose Hobbes is thinking about, um, you know, in any society or in any system, somebody's going to find the person in charge to be a tyrant and want to do away with them, want to overthrow them, want to kill them. And that, that can lead to a kind of civil war like you saw happening. He doesn't want that to happen, so that's that. You're not supposed to like that. You're, you're, supposed, to, you're supposed to sort of boo Thomas Hobbes in a way, because, you know, not only does he look like a sourpuss and have a sort of... Uh, mean-spirited quote about people. Um, he's a, a proponent of absolute rule. And we, as Americans, are not supposed to like that. We're supposed to like John Locke and, uh, and, and John Locke's belief in life, liberty, and property. <laughs> so John Locke, as I said, is living in a period of time during the Glorious Revolution. How wonderful, Glorious Revolution. You have a bad monarch, James II. You chase away semi-bloodlessly, semi, and uh, not actually take that off, and then being replaced by constitutional monarchs, William Mary. John Locke writes the first and second treatises of government. He goes back to that man in a state of nature as well, and doesn't think that man is going to club man for a carcass, he thinks that, yeah, there's a little bit of competition in the state of nature, but really, in general, the natural state of man is good and reasonable. So imagine two, uh, two cavemen come upon a carcass, instead of clubbing each other, clubbing each other over the head in order to you know, see who gets the whole carcass, maybe they each pull on one, one half of the carcass and it breaks apart and they can both eat. John Locke also says, that man possesses the right to life, liberty, and property. We kind of changed that a little bit, didn't we? When we had our own little revolution and our constitution and so on. What did we change it to? Okay. And then you can think about whether property is actually the pursuit of happiness or not. Uh, gaining stuff, does that make you happy? Well, same sort of deal. Man went from a mentage, from a state of nature, into a, a commonwealth, into a society where they had to give up their, their natural rights to do whatever they wanted. But there are these inalienable, or rights that you can't take away, rights that man possesses. Three rights, life, liberty, or freedom, and then property. And the, 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 the early people, you know, joined a kind of social contract together in order to not to keep each other competing each other over the head with, with clubs, but simply to protect those natural rights. The government exists to protect your life, and the government exists to protect your liberty, and the government exists to, um, to, to protect your property. And, and if the government isn't doing those things, then the contract is broken and you have the right to, in some way, shape, or form, replace the government, replace the sovereign. Does that make sense to you? It should. We, we, we think that's, you know, that's a foundation of, of, of our country. In addition to that, John Locke went on to talk about religion. And you might remember that James II is chased away for two reasons, really. One is, He's a, he's a would-be absolutist ruler. The other is that he's a Catholic. And for a lot of Englishmen, those two things go hand in hand. Uh, John Locke, 
feel it's important, looking back at the plight of the Puritans versus this game and now with this Catholic community getting taken away, that there should be some sort of religious toleration. He looks back perhaps at the three wars of religion. By the way, the English Civil War, I think, could arguably be called a fourth war of religion. But what he is advocating is a certain measure of religious toleration instead of destructive conflict. So not only should we like this guy because he's talking about inalienable rights, but we should like him because he's got this modern idea of uh, tolerating people with other beliefs. The person sitting next to you or behind you or in front of your class probably has some sort of different religious or spiritual beliefs from you. At one point in time, you would feel the need to hurt that person because they don't believe exactly what you do. And right now, in this classroom, there's only one person who feels that way, and there's another person who's not really that sure. We won't go into who that is. We know who you are. But in general, I think we're all just like, I don't care what you know, so-and-so believes. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't affect me. That's kind of where John Locke is heading. Each individual person is charged with saving their own soul, and religions of various kinds, various Protestant sects, uh, you know, uh, Judaism, Islam, and so on. If we want to get really big, uh, I, I don't think that, that John Locke is quite there yet. But John Locke sees various forms of church, er, of Protestantism, as different paths to the same goal. See that uh, that CR that's in parentheses? I, I do this every single year. I did this last year. I can't remember what that means. So <laughs> I'm sorry. Maybe like four days from now, I'll remember and I'll send everyone an email. Um, something has to do with the world. See what happens. Dang it. No, it's just something I care about. So I'll try to remember. I did this last year too. It took a few years. Oh, why did I get tattooed on the body? I don't think so, but that's, 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 that's a good suggestion. I know what NN means. That's why I put that in. That means New Monarchy or New Mexico. Uh, so, what he's saying is that the government shouldn't legislate faith and religion. It, it's, it's sort of a, uh, there is no point to it. You know how like Louis XIV thinks it's more powerful if, if everyone's Catholic? It doesn't really matter that much, and that's why we start to see all of these different states move away from that as a goal. Number four, control of the church is rapidly declining as people start to think that there's no point in that. So John Locke says, oh, well, you know, you should tolerate everyone except for Catholics and atheists. <laughs> that, that does make us laugh a little bit, because well, what's the, what do you think his problem is with Catholics other than just sort of a, an English prejudice? And by the way, tomorrow is, is the 5th of November, so tomorrow's bonfire night, if you want to burn a Catholic guy and die Boston, I think it be the time to do it. But why, what's the problem with Catholics? Uh, probably because he thinks that they're more, more loyal to the Pope than over here. That's it, yeah. And so that, that idea that Catholics have, have dual or split loyalties, this goes all the way up until, you know, uh, 1960 in the United States, when John Kennedy is the first Catholic who, who wins the presidency, or who has a decent shot at winning the presidency, and he has to go before a bunch of Baptists and say, I promise the Pope won't, you know, be running the country. So it's a really long-term sort of thing. The other one is atheists. What's the problem with atheists? They're not following the path to the said goal. Yeah, so they're all damned, right? And so they'll do whatever they want because they're damned. So you can't trust them to be moral, according to John Locke. John. He also writes a book on uh, human understanding and what the mind is uh, is like. Uh, Rene Descartes said, you can't do this. You, you can't, you know, sort of examine the mind. There are material things you can scientifically mess around with, um, but things of the mind, you can't. Well, you and I both know that that's not really true, and people spend a lot of time trying to figure out how the mind works. In fact, there's a whole branch of study called psychology that uh, some of you might study someday. So the essay on human understanding written around that period of time says that the mind of a human being at birth is a blank slate, that it is a tabula rasa. And every experience uh, 
that you have is a way that you start to fill that blank slate with information and you start to educate it. The wonderful thing about this is the thought that humans are not tainted with original sin and that humans aren't, you know, sort of naturally gravitate towards evil and uh, and there's the thought that if you educated a person properly, you could protect them. You educate somebody to be moral, to, to make the right decisions, and sure enough, uh, they're going to do that. So uh, that's a nice idea. I think. Uh, well, do you feel do you feel more moral? Do you feel do you feel like a better person because you've been sitting in school for ten to twelve years? Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Good. I'm glad. We're doing our job then. Um, once again, I think that if you haven't gotten there yet, maybe you, you go on to college or, or you do a lesson 12th grade. Hell, you can go on to college and, and then maybe then you'll be good moral people. There's John Locke. Not nearly the scholarly person that Thomas Locke was. Well, those are two Englishmen who had something to say about politics, a little bit about religion a little bit about how the mind works. I've got really the three great French-speaking philosophes from a little bit later period of time. I've given them to you in, in, uh, in chronological order, just like they did in chronological order. These three guys are um, Baron Montesquieu, a guy whose pen name is Voltaire, and then Jean-Jacques Rousseau. I think probably of those three, you talked about Rousseau the most in uh, in that case. That mm -hmm. Rousseau is a part of the Enlightenment as well. They're sort of at the end of the Enlightenment and starting to move beyond the Enlightenment to the next intellectual movement that counters the Enlightenment called Romanticism. But we'll study him. We'll talk about him nonetheless. You probably actually did talk about Montesquieu. Damn it, it's CR again. <laughs> uh, I think I got it. I think I got it. Just a second. Uh, Baron Montesquieu is a baron. He's a nobleman, and he's from France. And uh, the first thing that he's doing very early on in 1721 is criticizing French society. Remember that the Enlightenment is about critiquing tradition. It's about uh, uh, overcoming tradition in order to come up with a better way of doing things. And so, uh, Baron Montesquieu is right, writes in this uh, alleged travel uh, travel diary by a Persian person, uh, a Persian sultan or a Persian uh, uh, nobleman, who is traveling through France, allegedly, and then writing letters back home to people in Persia to explain French culture to the Persians. By the way, Persia is what country today? Iran. Iran, good. So he's basically an Iranian guy who's writing back to Iran to say, this is what France is like. So this is, uh, this is Montesquieu's way of critiquing and criticizing French society without saying, I, Montesquieu, think that this and that and the other. He's doing it for the eyes of the foreigner. And so he is, uh, he is criticizing uh, the, the hierarchy, he's criticizing society, he's criticizing how um, uh, this person guy's writing back home and says, you know, at home we have harems where, where you know, men have multiple, multiple wives, and the people here think that's crazy, but the people here are always cheating on their spouses, they're always, you know, um, engaging in illicit affairs and so on. And so, uh, once again, poking fun at, 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 uh, at the societal aspects. He's not really suggesting anything about changing society. He's just poking fun at his own life. Something which uh, deals with politics in a much more direct way is this thing that he writes in 1748 called Spirit of the Laws. And the French really hate the British a lot of the time, but then a lot of the time they really like the British as well. Or they, they beat France over the head by praising Britain. So what Montesquieu thinks is that, that the British in, seven, in the 1740s have the best possible political system. He loves that there are checks and balances in the British system. There are basically two different institutions in charge, right? And they're sort of checking each other's power. What two things are
are ruling together in Britain after the glorious revolution, right? Yeah, Parliament and King are supposed to be ruling together. He loves that. He thinks that that would be a really good idea. In fact, if you think about France then, maybe we know that the States General hasn't been called since 1612 or 1614, something like that. And he's saying, oh, you know, the King, the absolute ruler of France, should call a kind of Parliament together. Guess who's going to be in the Parliament? A guy like him. Right? A baron, a nobleman. And so he's, he's basically saying he wants to be a part of power too, that they should take power from him. Kind of makes sense uh, when you think of it that way. He also looks at different kinds of, uh, of political states. He talks about republics. He talks about, um, he talks about monarchies. And he talks about despotisms. The, the, the republic is nice. You know, it's a kind of constitutional state. You have some people who are in charge, not just one person. Uh, but he believes that can't work for a big country. It only works for a small country, like what do we have a republic in Europe that can't work? Dutch. The Dutch are the Netherlands. Good. So it's a tiny place. It works. He thinks monarchies are the best, but it should be a monarchy with some checks and balances and so on. And maybe people like him should help the king rule. Despotisms are these places like what you might have in the Ottoman Empire or in Russia, where you have you know sovereignty in one person, no checks, no balances at all. And he thinks that the uh, oftentimes the, the geography or the environment or the weather really has an effect on what kind of a, of a state uh, exists. What's what's well, he says the more extreme the weather, the more despotic the state. So if you think about Russia, it's extremely Oh, yeah, and maybe the Ottoman Empire is extremely. Voltaire, also a big fan of Britain. Voltaire is a, uh, a man who gets in trouble for being really funny or being really sarcastic. And he's always um, obnoxiously poking fun at France to the point that he gets in pretty big trouble doing that. He, he loves Britain. He has to spend some time in Britain. He, um, he insulted a nobleman. Uh, the nobleman had him beaten up. And uh, then he challenged the nobleman to a duel. And he, you can't do that. You can't just be you know a, a rather common person challenging the nobleman to a duel. He eventually uh, gets chased out of uh, France for a period of time. He goes to Britain. He uh, he compares. He watches the. Um, or he, he he hears about and thinks about the way that uh, France's scientific hero Rene Descartes and Britain's scientific hero Sir Isaac Newton were treated. And in Britain, Sir Isaac Newton is kind of a, a, a hero and loved and, and spent his whole life there and worked for the government. Um, you know, part of the London. Uh, the, the London Society that, that uh, was looking at science and so on, people loved him. In France, Descartes had the lead. He was afraid of being persecuted by the Catholic Church. He ended up in Sweden. So he's a very funny guy. He's kind of an obnoxious guy. He, like I said, he gets in trouble from time to time for his uh, for his opinions. He's also living in a place that you know where you can get in trouble for your opinions, where there is a one Catholic Church and and one absolute. His famous book is called Candide, and Candide kind of goes along with the, the enlightened idea of challenging authority. He's also responding to another philosopher and saying that you shouldn't be, um, you shouldn't be too optimistic, you shouldn't be overly optimistic about your chances of changing things. Yes, the enlightenment should change things, but um, the, how much you can change things really is uh, is a bit limited. So Candide is this guy who is crazy optimistic. He, he's kind of uh, he's kind of an optimistic. I don't want to call him an idiot, but it seems like everything that he sees, he's, he's like, you know, well, a thousand people just died, but there's still ten people left. Yay! Or you know, uh, there's a religious war happening. Bye. So he's he's kind of poking fun at Candide for being overly optimistic. Uh, it, wherever Kanji goes, he's experiencing all of these things that are based on ignorance and evil, and, uh, and not really realizing that that's what the world is like. 
once again, um, Voltaire sort of poking fun at the society, poking fun at the world for all of its problems and hoping that it would be keen in some way. The, the book ends, though, with, um, with the idea that, once again, we can't change things too much. So it ends with the idea that we must cultivate our own gardens. In other words, we can only change things really pretty close to us. Do what you can in your own little corner of the world. I think that the area where Voltaire gets the most um, the most credit is in dealing with religion once again and religious toleration. There is a court case or a trial that happens that Voltaire hears about and finds horrible. There is this thing called the Palace Affair, or Jean Palace is the person. Who, uh, who, who goes on trial. And uh, I'll, I'll just kind of tell you what the, what the trial is about and it goes along with this, with this uh, image here. There is a guy uh, who, whose son dies. Uh, this particular person, this is all her last, was a Huguenot. There are still Huguenots in France. There are still some Protestants in France. Uh, according to what he was charged with, he was charged with murdering his son. And uh, he was charged with murdering his son because, they said, his son wanted to become Catholic. So imagine that there's this super tiny religious minority, and supposedly this kid wanted to become part of the majority, and his dad kills him. Um, he was tortured, John Klaus was tortured, and of course admitted that that was true. And then in the 1760s, they kind of brought back a, um, or I don't know if they brought it back, but, but it seems like this shouldn't be happening in the 1760s. This right here is an image. They decided to kill Jean Calas. They decided to execute him by breaking him on the wheel. And uh, I don't know if you can exactly tell what's going on here, but essentially you take a giant wagon wheel, turn it on its side, put a person on the wagon wheel, and have part of their parts of their bodies hanging over the wagon wheel where it ends, and then you take a giant stick and you start breaking their bones. So imagine you, you know, break their wrist and then you kind of break their elbow and, and kind of break their bones and their legs and their arms and then you try to thread them through the wagon wheel, which is possible because you don't really have, you know, bones that are uh, intact anymore. It's a really particularly gruesome and horrible way to die. They do this because it's, you know, a horrible religious crime. He's trying to, um, you know, keep, keep his son from going to heaven if you want to think of it that way. Anyway. Voltaire hears about this, hates this, writes against it, and uh, kind of starts to come out with his belief that organized religion is organized intolerance. And the Bible, the, the thing that, that Martin Luther and, and John Calvin thought was, you know, the word of God, that the Bible is a weird collection of, um, of stories and anecdotes and contradictions and not really the word of God. Sola Scriptura doesn't make a lot of sense. We have a whole bunch of, uh, of, of Jewish guys from way back in the past were the ones who wrote the Bible. And he, he looks at the Bible as a, as a text. And you can see in the Bible there are like double stories of creation. There's just all sorts of uh, strange things. So in the end, what he, what he suggests, his way of, of cultivating his own little garden, would be to create a kind of rational religion called deism. Deism is the belief, kind of like going on with uh, what the scientific revolution is talking about, that God is the creator of the universe, a rational being who created the universe and, and wound it up like you would a clock and let it go. And sort of walked away, and, and God is just letting the universe do its thing. A rational God then uh, punishes people who, who, you know, quote unquote, sin or, or, or break morals and, and so on, or rewards people who are generally good. And that's pretty much it. There's a heaven, there's a hell. Good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. The rest of it is just extra stuff that, that really rational, reasonable people. 
people don't need. So that's what his, his suggestion is for rational, reasonable people like himself. He doesn't like the mob. He doesn't like regular people. And he thinks regular people with his view still good with religion. They need all the rituals, and they need sin, and they need um, you know, doing penance and, and that sort of thing. A couple of his funny quotes about intolerance or about the Catholic Church is one is, let's eat a Jesuit. Kind of an odd thing to say, but maybe. You know, instead of having the Jesuits educate people to be uh, slightly devoted to a church, um, eating them is maybe a better idea. Or crush the infamous sin, which is the church, the Catholic Church, and or intolerance. There's Voltaire. He's got kind of a little wry smile. He's having a good time. Finally, we'll talk about Jean-Jacques Rousseau. going to give you maybe a slightly different uh, impersonation or impression of, uh, of Rousseau than what you had in what you might have had in actually politics or government. He writes something called the social contact. It's that same sort of idea. Go back to kind of like caveman times or pre-civilization time. And uh, and what was life like? What were people like back then? He's got this this quote all men are born free, but everywhere in chains. And the chains are society. The chains are that taking away of your absolute freedom to live together with others in a social context. You're, you're bound up. You have to be. But kind of like John Locke, he thinks that uh, people are, are can be rational, they can't be reasonable. They don't have to bash themselves, bash each other over the head. And that people could make laws for themselves. What does that sound like? When we make laws for ourselves, instead of having a law given to us or told to us by an absolute ruler, doesn't it sound a lot like the D word? Democracy, right? Uh, sometimes, I don't know if you've ever had a class like that, where uh, you come in first day and the, and the teacher says, all right, class, uh, maybe the ninth grade government would be a good, good one to do this. All right, class, we're going to come up with, uh, we're going to come up with our class constitution. We're going to come up with our class bill of rights. What do you, how do you think we should, how do you think we should all behave? And then, you know, you start shouting things out like, I don't know, how do you think we should, we should run the, the class together? What's a nice thing? Don't interrupt. Yeah, I, I like this. Don't interrupt. You know, don't come late. And this, that, and the other. And before you know it, you, you basically created this list of things that the teacher wanted anyway. And hopefully, because you came up with it, you're going to obey it better. Is the thought. Well, what's best for all? Rousseau calls the general will. So things like not interrupting. If we were all perfectly rational and all perfectly reasonable. We would all understand what the general will is, and we would all behave in that way. Instead of true democracy, which is uh, we've got a group of people, and 51% of us decide what what's going to happen. Does that make sense? Uh, maybe 51% of us are, uh, are convinced that we should interrupt and the 49% of us who don't want the interrupting to happen, we're just out of luck because democracy says, you know, we're going to interrupt each other. Well, that's that's uh, the will of all. It's like the 51% sort of thing. Many selfish points of view. 51% of the selfish points of view, and, and that's what's going to happen. So instead of doing just straight up democracy, we we want to we want to make sure that the general will is the thing that rules. But, but who knows what the general will is, is the question. And, and the answer to that is truly rational, selfless, educated people. So here's my question to you. Let's assume that, that in this room we want the general will to rule instead of doing democracy. Um, who in this classroom actually is one of these 
people knows what's best for everybody. Which one of us in here, or which, which individuals in here, uh, are rational and educated and selfless and can tell, tell us the rest of us what to do? You're, are, you're, you're volunteering? You can if you want to. Maybe we should maybe we should shut our eyes for a moment. If you shut your eyes, if you are one of those people, shut your eyes for just a second. If you're one of those people, go ahead and raise your hand. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, those of you who didn't raise your hands, do you, do you trust the people who did? No. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is kind of the problem with Rousseau. Uh, Rousseau's going to be used in the French Revolution uh, to support dictatorship. <laughs> Basically, because there's all these people who come along and say, I know it's best for everybody. I'm so rational. And then you have to do it this way. Sometimes these rational dictators have to force people to be free. They have to force them to follow the general rule. And sometimes they just end up chopping people's heads off because those people don't go along with what the dictator says is the general rule. Uh, finally, Rousseau also talks just a bit about private property. And here's a, here's a way in which he he radically moves away from John Locke. John Locke says property is a fundamental right. Rousseau says that the first person to convince somebody else that this bit of land belonged to them and put a fence up was really a horrible person. <laughs> it sounds kind of like a communist. But for sure, uh, property is suspicious, uh, according to um, I'll tell you another couple things about Rousseau, and then, and then we'll be done for the day. Rousseau writes a book called Emilio. It's it's a it's a story of a little boy who is raised um, with rationality, but he's also raised with a kind of um, romanticism in addition to that. The, the people who raise Emilio realize that children go through stages of development, or people go through stages of development, that really look a lot like um, later evolution, in a way. That children, babies, start off as basically very animalistic. I don't know if you've ever like, been around a baby, but babies basically do two things. They, they, uh, they want to be fed, and then they poop, right? And they kind of scream. They don't do much else than that. They smile at you and things. Sometimes it just might be gas. But... <laughs> But they don't do very much. And then as, uh, as, as babies get into the toddler years, they become sort of like little savages. You're trying to control them. You're trying to civilize them. But they, you know, they do things that sometimes are out of control. As they move along, they, they start to be able to, um, to reason a little bit better. You know, you know, their mind develops. And they become kind of like civilized human beings. So there's this, this uh, period of, of um, evolution from uh, from. And when you're trying to educate a kid, like Emil, at first you kind of let him be animalistic. You let him romp around, you let him uh, smell the flowers and, and, uh, and, and have a recess and, and, and those sorts of things. Uh, later you might have to sit a little bit longer, but at first have them learn to play, have them learn to experimentation. Later you can have them sit down, you can have them start to read, you can have them start to write, as they get smarter and smarter and more rational. They're doing what you're doing right now. But you're, you're sedentary, you're, you know, you're kicking the whole time, you're running the whole time. There's no recess for you, there's no play, it's just, it's just this. That's where you're at. Memorization and rationalization. Uh, last thing I want to tell you is that she is a big proponent of breastfeeding. And there is this thing, maybe you know about this, there is this, there is a, a, a an institution in a wet nursing. Um, basically, upper class women and middle class women, once they have a baby, they, they hand that baby over to somebody of a lower social status or economic status, and that person breastfeeds their baby for them. Sometimes they send kids away to villages for the first couple of years of life, and then they're very animalistic uh, to, to have that happen. Rousseau thinks that's terrible. Rousseau thinks that you're losing a kind of connection between. Uh, between the natural state of a baby and a natural mother, and so he's a big proponent of that. People think he's crazy when they when they, when that first idea appears, um, but then later people 
I started to have a class where I'm in the classroom and start to see young kids. Much to the happiness, I think, of those babies, because those babies tend to survive longer when they're taken care of by their own mother and mother that just wants to get here for money. Rousseau also has, by the way, uh, a baby mama, not a wife, but uh, a woman that he has a relationship with. I think he has four children or five children. And you can imagine how, how Rousseau treats those children after writing a book like Emile. Actually not. He dumps them off at, a, at an orphanage and doesn't raise them at all. So don't do what, what Rousseau does, just do what he says. Things will work out better for us. I think I'm going to stop right there. And uh, maybe we can look really quickly at the learning objectives for this particular unit and see what they're all about.